Maybe that works. OK, so what I'd like to talk about is the uh, first the daily problem. And you're saying, wait, there was no daily problem. And you're right. I mean, it was a typo, and I, it was a typesetting mistake, and you didn't see the daily problem. But let me give you the daily problem. So there's no, home, home, no daily problem due today. But this is what it would have been. And maybe we'll go through it at least quickly. What I'm hoping you will see is at least why this is a, daily, a, a dynamic programming problem. And maybe to get that, because there's a certain smell these things have, OK, once you have seen enough of them. And it's important to at least develop that. So this has to do with the problem of typing in um, phone numbers on a standard telephone as efficiently as possible. So what was it? Again, you guys now have all have hip phones with uh, keyboards and all that. Um, back in the olden days, OK, if you talk to your parents or go to their parents' house, they will have a phone that has a keypad that looks like this. Does everybody remember phones that had keypads that looked like this? OK. And that there was a star symbol, and there was a uh, pound symbol, right? And if you wanted to type a phone number, let's say, what's a good phone number? The department number is 631-632. Uh, I think it's 8740, OK? What would you do if this was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? One way you could type it is with one finger. Go 6, 3, 1, 6, 3, 2, OK, 8, 4, 7, 0. Does everybody agree? OK. Now, could we do this faster with two fingers if we were agile enough? The answer should be the answer clearly yes, right? Where maybe I could uh, plan ahead and say 6. OK, it's clear I'm going to be using 6, 3 a lot, right? Maybe I'm going to keep go 6, 3, 1, 6, 3, 2. Does everybody, or maybe 6, 3, 1, 6, 3, 2. Does everybody see that if I have multiple fingers, I can potentially do this faster, right? And the time it takes to move a finger is proportional to the space, the distance apart they are. Does everybody agree with that? My question now is, can I plan ahead, given a phone number, so as to try to type this number as quickly as possible? OK? Any questions about this? OK? I'd like to be able to type the number using the smallest amount of elapsed time using two fingers. Does everybody have this get the idea of this problem? OK? And you may think, gee, this sounds ridiculous, right? But I, on the other hand, I will tell you I had a professor from our department who's interested in building a robot that could play the guitar, wanting to know something about how you would find the optimal fingering pattern for, you know, when you play a guitar, you move fingers around, right? And moving the fingering around depends upon what you're going to be playing next, OK? I'm not a guitar person, but you know, certain way you put your fingers make it easier to play certain notes in the future, right? And trying to, given the input is the song you want to play, the output, you know, can I tell you what your fingering pattern should be to minimize the displeasure, uh, you know, the, the difficulty of you playing that note, OK? That is exactly the same problem. Does everybody kind of see that on some cosmic level that's the same problem here? OK. Any questions? OK. So let's just go and do this very quickly. What is the first thing you do with this dynamic programming problem? What is the very first thing you do with any dynamic programming problem? Yes? What? Before I conceive of a recurrence relation, I need to know what function am I computing do I want the recurrence relation for? Does everybody see that? I can always give you a, a, a recurrence relation. Here's a recurrence relation. OK? That's a nice recurrence relation, right? We've seen it before. But does that have anything to do with our problem? We need to start out with what is our problem that we want to solve, right? So now, can anybody give me an uh, idea for a recurrence relation? I know you haven't seen this long enough, but does anyone want to make a proposal for what function we want to compute? Yeah? We want to compute cost for the next n numbers given a specific number. 
Say the cost for the n numbers given the next number. That's not not that's not what I think I want. Yeah. Uh, I guess we have uh, three inputs. One is. Uh, that's good. First question is what is the input? That's an excellent idea. What are the inputs? Uh, first two will be where is our decision? Okay, so there is going to be where is f one, where is f two, right? And what's the other one? Or what I would say is I, the position in the text. Because remember, what, it, what is best for me to do does not depend upon completely the next number. I have to look ahead, right? If I'm seeing that there's a huge number of pounds in the future, when I get a pound, I probably don't want to move my finger, right? Suppose the, you know, the number was pound one, pound one, pound one, right? I don't want to be doing this kind of thing, right? I want to be planting fingers here. So now let's let C sub i equal. What would my definition in English be? It would probably be something like, what is the minimum cost to type, you know, of, you know telephone one dot 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 through telephone I, the first I digits of my telephone number, with fingers ending in positions F1 and F2. Does everybody see what my function now is? I want to know what is the cheapest cost possible to type the first I characters of the phone number ending up in positions F1 and F2. Does this sound like this is helpful? How would I find this to find the optimal way, to, to, to the minimum cost possible way to type the cell phone, to type the phone number in? If I had this function, what would I want as the cheapest possible way to dial the phone number, period? OK, assuming my phone number is n digits long, what would be the value function that I would want? Yeah? You're still coming up with a recurrence relation. That's not quite what I'm asking for yet. I'm asking for, is this a useful thing to compute? OK? If I could compute this, would this solve my problem? Let's ask myself, OK? If it doesn't solve my problem, then I don't want to compute it to find the recurrence for it. Does this, how would I use this to solve my problem, yeah? OK, you are now saying, again, if I computed this recurrence, which doesn't yet exist, I could go back and do my thing again. OK? The question I'm asking is a little different. The question I want to ask is, what would I use this for overall? I claim that the minimum cost, let's call this a big capital C, to type in the first n numbers is going to be what? what I really want to know what's the cheapest way to type this thing out, right? If I had this function, could I find what's the cheapest way to type the first n numbers? OK. Yeah? you want the argument of this thing? No, I've got the arguments. I want to use this thing to give me the answer to what my problem is. I claim the problem doesn't say I want to know what's the cheapest way to put dial the first i numbers ending with my fingers in a particular position. It wants the cheapest way overall. So how would I use this? Yeah. Now, then, now we're talking. What you're saying is basically take the min over all f1 and f2 of c, n, c, f1, f2, n. Does everybody see this? OK, once I can know how to compute the optimal way of ending up with my fingers anywhere, the right way to find the cheapest way to dial this overall 
over all possible places I could end up. I will end up on the place that is the cheapest for me to do this. How many, does this make sense what I did? How many people does this make sense to? How many people does this not make sense to? Any questions? Yes? Well, what, where do I need to deal with the finger starting? How do I deal with the finger starting? What, what does the finger starting tell me? How do I encode that into my problem here? Okay, yeah. I think that's your initialization. That is my initialization condition, right? So what's that saying? C of, I think, pound, uh, what did I say I wanted it? Pound, uh, where did I say my finger start? Star pound, doing zero digits of my telephone number. What's the cost of doing that? Zero. Boom, now I've got an infinite thing, right? So now I've got an initialization condition. You're right. OK? Does everybody, what I want you to see is I've now got a function definition that can be used to solve my problem. I needed to have some state here that I don't really, in the big picture, care about. But to make sure I try all possibilities, I need to have that state, right? Any questions? Now, can someone give me a recurrence relation to compute this thing? OK. What would C of F1, F2, sub i equal to? Does anyone want to make a proposal? Okay. What would a recurrence for this? Yes. The minimum over what? So you want to say over all, let's say, f1 prime, prime, f2 prime, right? What do you want to take? You want to know what was the cost of getting to f1 prime, f2 prime, after i minus 1 characters, right? And then is there anything else we want to add to that? Yeah? Uh, I think the cost to get from F1 prime to F1. Does everyone see that it's plus, depending upon if, how we want to do it? But because something like the distance from F1 prime to F prime, F1, plus the distance from F2 prime to F2. OK, let's think if this makes sense. OK, this says what's the cheapest way to, to, to dial the first i numbers here, where my fingers end up here? Well, before that, I had to have gotten to a particular, dialed the first i minus 1 numbers on my phone. My fingers had to be sitting someplace then, right? And what am I going to do? I am going to have to pay the cost now of moving them from that state to the current state, which, as I have it here, here I'm paying the cost of some of those movements. Perhaps if I wanted to minimize time, I would want to instead replace that by the maximum. Am I moving these fingers one at a time? Or am I moving these fingers in parallel? If so, then I'd probably want to take the maximum of those two distances. But does everybody see that this is the cost of finger movement? OK? And if we see that, that then should be clear. The cost of ending up at this spot is the cost of getting to some previous place, plus the cost of moving your fingers there. Does everybody kind of get that idea? How many people see roughly where this recurrence comes from? Any questions about it? Yes? What are F1? These are previous finger positions. OK. What is the best way to drive 
to New York, to, to end up at my apartment in New York City. Well, it is the cost of driving to some previous place, the best way to drive to some previous place, plus the cost of moving from that place to my apartment, right? So think about this. This is saying that the best possible way to um, end up with my fingers here, having dialed those first I numbers, is to dial the first I, is, I, however I do it, I am going to have to dial the first I minus one numbers. And I'm going to have to put my fingers someplace after I have done that, right? The optimal solution is going to involve dialing the first I minus one numbers in the way that leaves my fingers in the best possible place so that now when I die, pay the cost of getting to that point plus the cost of the last step, I minimize the total. Isn't that what we're trying to do? This is the cost of the cheapest way to dial the first I minus one digits in a place where it is advantageous to put the fingers, right? And this is the cost of, if we had left the fingers there, this is the cost of finishing the job, right? Maybe if at the end I want to type a pound, let's think about it. Let's say I want to type the pound symbol, right? Am I better off having put my fingers here and here at a cost of 172? Or am I better off having put my fingers here and here at a cost of 174? Okay? It depends upon what the cost is. This is if, the, if, I've, if, if my last thing is just to type that pound, is it better off to have gotten ended up here cheaply and pay that movement, or end here less cheaply and pay that movement? Which is better? Depends upon the cost of the movement, right? But it should be clear that what I want to do is to minimize the sum of these things. And it's the cost of getting to a place plus the cost of finishing the job. There's many different places I could have gotten. There's different cheapest ways of ending up here or here or here or here or here or here or here. Each of them would have cost a certain amount to dial the first n minus one numbers. What's the best way overall? Once I know those costs, I can pick which was the best way to have, where I wanted to have started from. Because it will minimize the cost of getting there, plus the cost of the work to be done. Any questions? About
Okay, is that better? I think that is better. Okay, any questions now? Any other questions about this example? Okay. There are details that you have to do to get the cost function right, but that's where the problem dirtiness comes in. How is it that fingers move on a cell phone? Once you have come up with that cost function, this algorithm is what does the optimal planning to figure out where you should put it. Any questions? Yes? What was the what? The max is for the fact that how much time will it take for me to move my fingers? Let, let's put it this way. Suppose I want to move my fingers from here to here. OK, am I allowed to move one finger at a time or two? If I move one finger at a time, it's the cost of doing that plus the cost of doing that. Does everybody see it? What if I'm allowed to move two fingers at once? Then at the speed that I am banging my finger, stop, keep going. It's the larger of the two. Does everybody see that? So that's what it's capturing. If I'm moving my f two fingers at once, the time it takes me to do something like that is, you know, if I have you guys have a race, let's say that, uh, let's, let's think back to the last exam, right? There were these people I had in this room and there wasn't a room for them, right? And I then had to start the uh, exam, okay? How much time did it take till I could start the exam? Was it the sum of the times it took people to run over? Or was it the, the, the longest it took for somebody to run over? I took the max of the, the speeds. I took the slowest person, right? And that's what I waited for. And that's what I guess the issue is here. If I was paying for how much unnecessary running did I cause, that would be the sum. If I wanted to worry about the absolute time period, when could I start my exam, it was the max. Any questions about that? Any other questions about this, this thing? Yes? How long does it take to compute the distance? Well, this is the distance between two finger positions on a telephone keypad. How long should that take? It should be constant time, right? It's some kind of a Euclidean distance calculation or some voodoo that you're doing about this thing. But this is. You know, this is basically two points, and it's a distance. It's an x, y, and an x, y. It should take constant time to compute that distance. OK, any questions? So what's the complexity of this algorithm? It's how many boxes times how long does it take to fill a box? Does everybody agree? How many boxes are there? How many boxes are there in this particular problem? If let's say there are k fingers on k, um, what you call it, points on the keyboard. What's the time it takes? How, mu how, mu how much time? What's the size? Blah, blah, blah. Let me get my chalk for a second. Is there chalk here? If not, this is bad. Uh, give me one more. On the desk behind my mic. Thank you. Okay. How many boxes are there on this thing? If there are k different key keys on the keypad, how many boxes are there? Okay, the phone number is of length n, and there's k finger buttons on the, on the telephone. How many? Does everybody see that this goes from 1 to k? This goes from 1 to k. This goes from 1 to n, right? So there's k squared n possibilities. Does everybody see that? And how much time does it take to fill a box? How much time will it take to fill each box according to this recurrence? OK, what? Constant? Well, I don't think it's constant, yeah. Well, it, it could be. Actually, to be precise, as I've done it here, I am taking the min over two arguments, right? What are the choices of the argument for this one? 1 to k. What are the choices for this one? 1 to k. How many possible inputs are there to consider? k squared. Does everybody see that? If I'm taking this like the min of two loops, this goes from 1, i goes from 1 to k, j goes from 1 to k, right? So as written out here, this should be k squared. Does everybody see that? So that would argue to me that as I've described it here, n times k squared boxes, 
And I'm saying it's n squared time per box, yeah? Okay, so, so right now let's say that this is, let, let's ignore that for now. We agree that as, as this algorithm said, would be that it would be order n to the, um, what you call it, to the n times k squared times k squared. This would be order n to the k to the fourth, okay? Now, maybe there's a way of doing it faster, but let's not, let's not delve into that, okay? Any questions about that? Yes? Well, okay, so what if I only, okay, so one possibility is that instead of dealing with, this may be how you want to get it down to n, k, k to something, what if I instead say that it's infinite unless I, 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 I end up with my finger on the number I typed, right? In that case, if I know that I'm going to have to type a number, either this finger or this finger has to end up on the right spot. Does everybody agree? Once I say this one's got to end up where the pound is, then this is the variable that has to move, right? And now this would only move, there would be only k choices here. Does everybody see that? If I'm, I'm going to rule out anything where I don't end up on the right spot, then you're right. Then there's only a linear number of spots. Okay? Yes? Well, it depends. Again, these are now what I will say the rules of what you're trying to do. If you're telling me that I'm not going to be allowed to move my uh, other finger while I'm moving this one, maybe I'm going to strategically move this finger while I've got the time. Do you see that if I looked at, could look ahead to see what the next number was, maybe it paid to move my finger into the, a different spot, right? Uh, maybe it's the one that pay, is in the next spot. The other possibility, though, maybe I need to type numbers on, what if it was a world where I was typing a bunch of numbers here and a bunch of numbers here? I would like my fingers to specialize a little bit. Okay? So again, w the way to think about this, I want to move on, but the way I'm thinking about this is, I am solving it in brute force generality. Does everybody see this? I am trying all possibilities and picking the best one. Am I right? The answer is yes. If you're going to tell me that, that you want to ignore certain possibilities or considerations, okay, maybe I don't need to try all possibilities then, okay? But in general, for correctness, I like to think it's easier to think about all possibilities. That's the level in which I'd like you to be thinking about it now, okay? Any questions? Okay. Okay, let's move on. Any questions about this one? Okay, so let me just try one last time on, let me show you one last, what I hope, I think, I'm pretty sure, last dynamic programming application. Have any of you ever seen this thing before? Where have you seen this thing? Yeah? In my textbook. In my textbook. Anybody else have, see one of these things? <laughs> How many of you have one in your pocket? Okay, everybody has it in their pocket. Pull out your driver's license. Okay, look on the back of your driver's license. You will have one of these things. If you have a New York driver's license, okay, there will be one of these things on the back of your New York driver's license. Okay, any questions? Did anybody look at it? Okay, now why is this thing on the back of your driver's license? Okay, the answer is what you see there is basically your prison record. Okay, and... Um, that what has happened is there is that that is encoding information about you. Next time you speed and the cop pulls you over, the cop is going to say, may I have your license? They're going to go back and scan this and learn all about you. Okay, are you a dangerous criminal that I should be careful about? You know, have you been stopped for speeding before? Okay, what grade did you get in 373? These kind of things. Okay. <laughs> Now, what is that thing encoded for, okay? That thing is encoded using a data compression scheme. Did everybody agree that some of you in here have relatively long prison records 
And it's hard to put that text, all that text, in that small barcode. You'd like to come up with a scheme to compress this thing so they could put as much of your prison record as possible in the size of that thing. They don't want to give these people larger driver's license, right? You can get a driver's license with two pieces in it. No, so, so they got a, there's a text compression problem. How can we express a text file efficiently in u- using um, this kind of barcode scheme? And the way that they did it was the following. That, that, that the thing that they came up with was a standard for data compression that, um, that does the following, okay? It was a, uh, they had four different character modes. They said some people, they want to express all alphabetic characters. Sometimes you'd like to have a shorter com- code that just encoded lowercase letters. Does everybody agree that if you put your, if, if I knew your prison record was in lowercase, completely in lowercase, it would take less bits to encode that than if it was a mix of upper and lowercase characters, right? You guys know about ASTI, you know about how you know, eight-bit codes. If we throw out the capital letters, we only need half as many possible codes. We can get away with less bits, right? They said sometimes you're going to want to encode. I think this was for all caps. I think this was for all lowercase. I think this was for a mix of upper and lowercase. And this was punctuation and other things that you would have. Okay? And the way they said that you could describe a message was you started in some mode, and to express a message, you had a choice of typing out a character that was in that mode table, or permanently jumping into a mode, which cost you one command, and then now you're in mixed mode, and then you could say jump back to, make per- so latch meant permanently jump into a mode, um, uh, I think, what was the other one? There was latch and there was shift was like an escape character. When you hit the shift button, it it puts you in another mode for one moment and then you let go. Does everybody get that idea? So a shift for one character let you be into that mode and then jumped you back to where you were. A latch moved you back into that mode completely. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So if your thing you were going to type was going to involve one capital letter, Maybe you should go into the, the shift mode there and then jump back, right? So that would cost you one shift into this, type that, and now you're backed in mixed mode. Alternately, if you're going to have a lot of capital letters here, maybe it would pay to jump permanently into that mode, do your capital letters, and then jump someplace else. Does everybody kind of get this idea? Every one of these modes has a certain set of characters that you could type out, okay? You have a choice of, at any point, jumping into another mode permanently or jumping for one character, okay? And what did you want to do? You wanted to try to find, for your particular prison record, what is the sequence of jumps and latches and character typeouts that is the one that would use the fewest symbols. How many people sort of see the picture that I'm saying here? How many people don't see the picture that I'm saying here? <clears throat> Any questions about that? Okay. So what was the story there? The story basically was, when I talked to these guys, it's, it was then symbol technology. It's now, I think, part of uh, Nortel, I think. Or so. it, it was, it, symbol technology was bought out by, I think it was Motorola. And they, they're, they're still located, I think, down... Um, on Long Island, but they have a different name now than they used to. But, um, but anyway, what was the idea? Suppose you wanted to type out this message using the fewest symbols. What would be the right way to do it? Each mode had a certain set of characters that you could type. Some of them are going to be in many of the modes. Some of them are going to be in only one of the mode. There is a cost from shifting from one mode to another. And you could decide to shift permanently or shift for just one, which then put you back in your old mode. What would be the right way to express a message? My claim was they had this system, they were using heuristics. Oh, if there's going to be a lot of capital letters, switch into the capital letter mode, do that. And I said, no. 
This is dynamic programming. Why is it dynamic programming? You want to know what is the cheapest way to type any prefix of the message ending up in any one of the modes. Does everybody kind of see that? Suppose I know the cheapest way to type the first 10 characters ending up in all four modes. What is the cheapest way to type the first 11 characters ending up in alpha mode? It is going to be the min over all modes of the cost of getting to the 11th, 10th character in that mode plus the cost of jumping from that mode to this mode, outputting the, that, that character, and ending up in that mode. Possibly by issuing a latch command. Here we were already in the mode, so if there was an A in there, it would just be one more symbol plus this. From this mode, maybe it was going to be, I didn't have an A here. I would latch into here and then issue the A. And that would be two commands plus this. Does everybody kind of get that idea? My claim is that the cheapest way to encode the first I characters of text ending up in mode J is going to be the min over all possible mo previous modes K of the cost of Kachunk encoding the first I minus 1 characters ending in J and then paying the cost of encoding the ith character and shifting to mode J. Does everybody see that? It's got to be this way. What's the cheapest way of ending up with the first I characters ending up in J? Well, somehow you encoded the first I characters. And somehow you were in a state when you did that, right? The cost was the cheapest of all possible ways. You wanted the cheapest way to end up at that state. Okay, that's what would be stored in the table, right? The total cost is we find what was the right previous mode to be in to minimize this sum. Okay, and once you do that, then basically the, sh the minimum tar the shortest path through this dynamic programming matrix, describes the cheapest way to encode your prison record. Any questions about that? How many people see, kind of see this? Okay, how many people don't see it? Okay. And again, this is in some sense the same basic structure as the recurrence we had here, right? OK? And it's the way we encode basically all shortest path kind of problems. This is the same way Floyd's algorithm, I mean, you know, when we looked at describing a, a, a recurrence relation for finding shortest paths, this is what it was doing, right? A lot of dynamic programming problems are shortest path problems in disguise. And what's the shortest path to node i ending up in j? It's the shortest path getting to some other vertex plus the cost of moving to that, from that vertex to here. Right? And that's exactly what we're doing. Yes? What was their original algorithm? Their original algorithm was look ahead a couple of characters and say what, was they, what they thought was good. OK? So they looked ahead and said, OK, you know, if I'm going to have a character, if I look ahead that I'm going to have several characters that are going to be al alphabetical, probably if there's a way of me ending up in that uh, capital letter mode, maybe I'm going to want to do that. So they did a heuristic, they did a seat of the pants kind of thing. Okay? I found what was provably, the, my student and I found what was provably the right way to do this. Okay? And so once you give me your character encoding standard, you look at the official PDF 417 standards, that will describe what this coding scheme is. For any prison record, we will find the provably minimum number of symbols to encode it, even though there's a large number of different ways to encode your record. OK, any questions about that? Yes. Oh, sorry, yes. Well, let's take a look. Okay, how much time does it take to do looking ahead? And this, this depends what they're doing, and God knows what they're doing. But how long does it take to do dynamic programming is a good question. What is that going to be? If I have M modes and N text, what is the time of this going to be? It is the number of boxes times the cost per box, right? 
If I have m modes and text of length n, how many boxes do I have? I didn't hear that. How many boxes? If there are m modes and n characters in the text, how many boxes are there? n times m. And how much time does it take to fill in a particular box? I am minimizing. I know I've got it. If I'm in character position i, I cared about encoding the first i minus 1 characters. So this is fixed, right? My only choice is what was my previous mode, right? So this would be order m. OK? So it's m steps per box times mn boxes. This would be m squared n time to do the whole thing. OK? Yeah? Well, what, take a look at this min. What is this minimum over? Does everybody agree? The way I look at it is I try to read what this recurrence is. OK? The recurrence is telling me, take the min over what? I didn't show you what the arguments here. But what is the variable that I'm minimizing over here? Read the recurrence. What is the variable that I'm minimizing over? It's k. OK? Does everybody see that the only thing that matters here, if I want to find the cheapest way to encode character up to the, the, the first i characters ending up in mode uh, j, I would have been the cheapest way to encode the first i minus 1 characters ending in some mode, plus the cost of the last operation, which is a character in a mode switch. Right? So the cost of this, I'm minimizing over all previous modes k. This is what I want people to understand. So let's think about this one. This is now important. For the correctness of what I am doing, does everybody see the little k written here? And that this is a mode. OK? The cheapest way to encode the first i characters ending up in mode j I had to have first encoded the first i minus 1 characters, ending in some mode. OK? And then paid the cost of going from that mode to the mode I want to be in, while simultaneously expelling the character I need. OK? Any questions? So what is this? It should be clear that this is n times m boxes if there are m modes, and that it takes order m time per box. And what is m in, in this particular application? What is m? What was it? m was equal to 4, right? So this is order n times 4 times 4, 16n. That's basically linear time, right? What's the most time-consuming part of the problem? Printing out the barcode at the end, right? You have to spend order time, end time on the printer to spit out the, the barcode, right? Any questions about this as an example, as an inspiring example? OK, any questions? OK, so next time you get caught for speeding, turn over your license with pride as an expert on dynamic programming. OK, <laughs> any questions here? OK. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, OK, let's just put it this way. I have something else I would talk about. But I want to ask right now, is there anything that, for a review point of view, someone would really love to see me talk about? Quickly. Yes? So the question was on depth first search, why was it that it took order n time to find the cycle in a graph on n vertices and m edges? Now it is true that if we had an adjacency list, we did a dynamic program, we did a uh, depth first search, the complete depth first search would take n plus m steps. Does everybody agree? What was cool about the cycle problem? OK. When did we stop? The cycle said, the moment you found the back edge, you found the cycle, right? How long could we go until we had hit a back edge? 
Even if we had n squared edges, m was big, right? But everything was either a tree edge or a back edge, right? And it was only, we could only have gone n minus 1 steps of building our tree. The nth edge had to be a back edge, right? Or by the time we've hit n edges, we would have seen at least one back edge. So does it have a cycle? We could stop right there. That was the whole point of that thing. Any questions? Anybody else have anything they're dying to know? Yes? So don't look at the recurrent combinations that we've done. We look at the minimum for the same two things, and sometimes we look at the minimum over all choices of like some of the yeah. So when, sometimes I said, like, like you're saying in edit distance, you took a look at the minimum of three things. In this one, I took the minimum of it looked like n squ f squared things. Is there a guideline? The answer is it depends upon what the problem that the recurrence is asking for. Okay, that, that, that you know, how complex is what's being asked for by the recurrence? So the question really is how much... But the, the way that I think about these things, this is why when I go back there, my first question is, what are the arguments I need for my recurrence? Okay, I say write down an English explanation. But a simpler way of saying that, at least at first, are what are the arguments I need? How much previous state do I need to make a good decision about what I care about? Right? And then typically what happens is I'm iterating over all possible previous decisions. That's typically what happens. You know, you, know, it, you know, it depends upon your particular thing. But that's basically how I see it, okay? I come up with what do I need to know in order to make the right decision for the last move, okay? And then I try all possibilities. Yes? So I'm taking the minimum, the minimum typically of all possible states, previous states. That's generally what I'm doing, right? If there were two or three previous states that mattered, then it was the min of two. If there are here as there are f squared, I take that. So that's usually where this comes from. Okay? Any questions? Yes? How can you tell whether a greedy algorithm will work or won't work? The answer is, you try to find a counterexample, right? If you find a counterexample, it doesn't work, right? If it doesn't find a counterexample, what do you try to do? You try to find a proof that it does work, right? That it's always correct. What if you can't find the convincing proof? You go back and try to find another counterexample. Does everybody kind of see that? Now, you know, does a greedy algorithm work? Usually it doesn't, okay? So when I'm betting, you know, when, when somebody comes to me and says, oh, here's a greedy algorithm, does it work? My answer is usually no, okay? Is the answer yes sometimes? Yes. I try to reason this thing out, okay? Any questions? In fact, there was one, if we're going to do this, I guess. Um, you may remember that we talked about this problem of cutting sticks. I think you may remember I raised this question in here. We wanted to take strings and we wanted to cut it into pieces in the minimum cheapest way to do it. And so let's just remember what our story here is. Here I am giving you a set of, you know, a stick, a, a string, and I have cuts on it. And I wanted to try to find what was the sequence of cuts so that I would minimize the cost of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, the, the running sums of the pieces, where the cost of cutting a piece was the length of the piece, right? Remember that problem? And there was an idea for a greedy algorithm that somebody had. Does anyone remember what's a good greedy algorithm? You were pretty convinced of it? Yeah? Anybody? Some people said, oh, pick the cut that's near the middle. Right? Pick the cut that's most in the middle of the string. You want to divide it in half as best as you can, right? And they said, well, that's got to work, right? Does it work? Well, how do you tell? 
You come up with a wishy-washy proof, it's always going to work, right? You come up with, look for a counterexample. What would be a, a hard case for picking something in the middle? In general, I want to think, where is when there's a lot of other possible choices, nearly as good, right? What if the string was this? Where this was a distance of x, this was a distance of x, which is small, and this is a big distance, right? What would this one have done if we were looking at the, uh, what you call it, uh, the middle one? would have cut right in the middle, right? What would this have cost? It would have cost these steps, and now you've got two pieces that look like this, right? And this one is going to cost d plus x, and the other one is also going to cost d plus x. So the total cost of that would have been what? 3d plus 2x, am I right? Can anybody suggest a better cut, first cut? Yeah? Either one to the right or one to the left. What if I instead cut this one here, right? What's the cost of that cut going to be? Does anyone remember? It would be D. But now what is left? This one is completely done, right? Now I've got something of length D, you know, basically D over 2 plus 2x, right? What should my next cut be? Yeah? If I then cut this, what would the cost of this be? This would be d over 2 plus 2x, something like that. And now I've only got this piece to work on. What's the total cost? OK. Now this is 2x, and I would be done, right? Does everybody see that if I do that, that was something like Three, uh, that was going to be 3 halves d plus something like 4x, which is small. Does everybody see that this is going to be half as expensive as this one did? Right? Usually, the greedy one doesn't work. OK? Not always. Can I say always? You've got to be suspicious before you believe that the greedy one is correct. And how do I look for counterexamples? I usually look for something that is going to be seemingly hard, make it symmetric, push things so that there's small differences between them, okay, and see whether it leads to a problem, okay? Any questions about that? Any other questions about anything to prepare for the exam? Yes? OK, if I have a directed acyclic graph, should I topologically sort it? OK, so generally speaking, again, when they say these things, you're not over some well-defined probability distribution. But if I have a graph with n vert a, a DAG with n vertices and m edges, what's the cost of doing anything on that graph? n plus m. Does everybody agree that if I, you know, I can't look at the graph in less time than that? How much time does it take to topologically sort the graph? n plus m. OK, it essentially costs me nothing to topologically sort it. Does everybody see that? In a big O world. OK? Once it's topologically sorted, the graph may look differently. OK, as it does, you know, if, and for a lot of problems, it tends to look. Now you're thinking about, oh, I have this ordering here. Maybe now if I process the vertices in that order, I've got a tool to think about it, right? So why do I say that that's a good thing? It should be clear it doesn't cost you anything. If you're gonna, since every algorithm should be at least time linear in the size of the graph. And it gives you a whole other way to look at this thing, OK? Any questions? Any other questions about uh, anything on, for the exam? OK, any other questions? OK, I've got one question for you guys. Where do people whose, whose nest names begin A through H go for the exam on uh, Tuesday? OK, where is that? Does anybody know? CS room 120. OK, that's what I need to know. Any other questions? OK.
Yes, a question. And stick, stick, stick it out, because if not, I'm, I have something I'll subject you to if not. Yes. What are the steps to solving a dynamic programming problem? Okay, item number one is write out something that will sol that if you could solve it, if you could compute it, would do what your problem is. State it in English with the arguments of what you're going to be doing. This gives you a target to write a recurrence for. Does everybody see it? If you randomly write a recurrence, it can't possibly be right. Does everybody see that? If, on the other hand, you have a description, and certainly we can't see that it's right. If you randomly, on, on the other hand, if you come up with a statement of something that you can compute that would help you decide the answer, then you are living large. Does everybody agree with that? Okay? Once you have this, my next step is to try to find a recurrence that will compute this thing recursively. Does everybody see that? What do I do then? At that point, what I would probably say is, typically, I will ask you for how much time will this take? Usually on the problems, I'll be content if you just give me the recurrence and tell me the time that it takes. I'm not going to ask you to necessarily write the loops to, to uh, fill in the table right. But you should be able to see that so long as it's depending upon arguments that are smaller than the original one, there is an order to put it in the table such that the items are there when you need them. Okay? And what I would ask you for is, typically, give me a recurrence. Perhaps explain to me why this is a sensible recurrence. Okay? And I would say, what is the running time of the resulting